Detroit has a new police chief, at least for a while. We'll talk to James White about priorities at a critical time in the nation's police departments. Meanwhile, did his predecessor leave office to run for governor? We'll check the Michigan political landscape where there are burning issues everywhere. Today is Sunday, June 6, 2021, and this is Flashpoint. Hi there, welcome to Flashpoint. We missed you last week thanks to the schedule shuffle brought about by the Indy 500, and we're going to miss you next week due to the French Open. So we've got a lot to get to this morning. We're going to start with the change at the Detroit Police Department. James Craig has turned in his badge. We'll see if he trades it for a campaign button. But in the meantime, with an intense spotlight trained on American law enforcement, James White gets the nod as the interim chief as the search for a permanent chief gets underway. I suppose congratulations are in order for Chief White. And yet he's taking on a job that has to withstand demands even from his local congresswoman to defund or even dismantle the police. It comes with gun violence spraying forth on a nightly basis in the city. And drag racers and drifters have decided the streets are theirs. What does James White have in mind? We're going to talk with the new chief in just a minute. We also need to catch up on some bread and butter politics. Thanks to Craig's musings about a candidacy, the governor's race is clearly getting early attention. And there's a Detroit mayoral race that is about to intensify, too. All happening while the new redistricting commission is at work. And I don't know one Michigan political watcher who has the slightest clue as to exactly what they're going to deliver. It's all coming up, too, today on Flashpoint. Mayor Duggan's choice for a new interim police chief in Detroit doesn't need a tour of the headquarters or directions to the bathroom. He knows the place very well, having served as deputy chief for years before leaving to run the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. That seems an interesting intersection, doesn't it, given the intense focus on the intersection of policing and civil rights right now. Very good to have interim chief James White with us today on Flashpoint. Chief, I appreciate your time. You said right out of the gate that you had no intention of trying to be James Craig. I know that was not a dig at James Craig. Explain what you meant. No, not a dig at all. Uh, James Craig is probably um, one of the, the most popular chiefs in my career uh, with the Detroit Police Department. He, he arrived at a time where he was clearly the best chief uh, we've had at the right time in the department's history. Uh, so, you know, to try to fill his shoes is not really something that I'm, 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 I've got my um, desire to do. I mean, I think that I need to learn from, from the chief some of the things that he did in the organization uh, at, at a time when we, we needed the leadership that we received. Uh, but to try to impersonate uh, James Craig is, is, is just <laughs> not that I think is advisable. You know, for, for his, all of his popularity, and clearly we, uh, I think a lot of people felt there was terrific leadership, especially uh, last summer of the department, but uh, he, leave, he leaves office at a time when there is uh, this massive spike in gun violence all over uh, a lot of American big cities, including the city of Detroit. What do we do to get a handle on it? Yeah, it's, it's, an, un, it's an unprecedented time in, in history. Uh, certainly, uh, like you've indicated, Devin, around the country right now, we're seeing a spike in violence, particularly gun violence. Uh, here in Detroit, uh, we, we've seen our increase as well. Uh, gun violence is everywhere. We, we have to focus, redouble our efforts, put boots on the ground. Certainly, everyone who can patrol needs to patrol, uh, engage the community. There are areas in our commu community where uh, the spikes are a little higher than other areas, so we, we certainly have to make sure that we are not only out uh, in force, uh, because you're not going to be able to arrest your way out of this problem, um, but it's going to require some community engagement. It's going to require knowing what some of the problems are, some of the hot spots, and, and, and truly engaging our community. Um, Chief Craig never really enjoyed talk about fewer guns. He's a, a pretty full-throated supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, I, I know a lot of people, you must hear from all the time, that from people telling you that there's just too many guns around. Uh, do you part ways with Chief Craig on that at all? Well, I, I don't know if, if, if it's necessarily a, a part ways. I think two things can be true at once. You can, you can have uh, support of the Second Amendment, but at the same time, uh, responsible gun ownership uh, safety is paramount. I mean, we, we can't have the situations that we're seeing now. We, we can't have people uh, attempting to dis resolve disputes uh, with using weapons. I mean, you, you've got simple arguments that are resulting in gunplay. Uh, the unfortunate circumstance a few weeks ago, a young lady in, in getting gas at a gas station and, and two people have some conflict and they, they get in, uh, you know, exchange of gunfire. 
uh, and this 18 year old is struck and, and, and killed. I mean, that's absolutely unacceptable. I mean, that's, that's horrible. Uh, this young girl will not get an opportunity to, to, you know, go to college, get married, you know, have a life um, by virtue of stopping and, and fueling up uh, at, a, at a local gas station. So um, there's gun, there's, I don't have a problem with responsible gun ownership. I have a problem when people decide to use a weapon to, to resolve a very simple dispute. Um, it, it, we have, as a, a part of the city that you uh, now will have to police, uh, is represented by a congresswoman who has famously said that we need to get rid of policing, we need to get rid of, uh, of, of mass incarceration. You just left a position where I know across your desk almost every day you were reading complaints from people who felt that they'd been uh, handled inappropriately uh, or even criminally by police. Tell me a little bit about what you hear and what you intend to do about those who say we need to defund police. Well, well let, me, let, me, let me start by saying I, I don't support defunding the police. Um, we have a great relationship with our community here in Detroit. Um, you know, we, we have to simply assist the police and, and add uh, components to policing to ensure that the police are put in the best position to be successful. Now, that's not to say that I don't support reforms. I mean, reforms are necessary. Anyone uh, who, who who thinks that they're not simply not paying attention to some of the issues that are trending around this country. Um, it's certainly what culminated last year with the tragic murdering uh, of, of Mr. Floyd uh, yeah. speaks volumes to where we are uh, as a society. So to, to, to say that reforms aren't necessary uh, is not an appropriate comment. But I think reforms uh, are specific to the community in which you're serving. Reform is not a broad brush approach. Uh, when I was at the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, having retired from Detroit Police Department as an assistant chief, I spent a lot of years working with our consent judgment, 11 years in fact, uh, and, and we were able to build model policy in the Detroit Police Department and model policy being policy that is best practice compared to other agencies around the corner or around the country. And, and what's important with that is if you have an agency that is progressive, that has model policy and that holds this agency accountable, uh, you're able to responsibly police a community. Now, if a situation arises where you get it wrong or something happens or there's a problem in the in a policing agency, you hold the officers accountable. Yeah. I mean, you have to you certainly have to support the officers. You have to get out front and make sure that the officers are supported and upright, but more but equally as important is the idea that when something is wrong or something goes wrong, that you get out front and that you're transparent with the community. So when we talk about, you know, defunding the police, I think what we what we need to do is really define that as what we're talking about. Certainly there are times where we can have situations where uh, policing needs to expand how it, it does its work. Uh, we, we have a tremendous issue with, with mental illness in our country. Yep. Uh, Detroit is not unlike any other major city. Uh, we know that we've lost 16 mental health facilities in the state of Michigan uh, in the past 15 years uh, or a little bit longer. What happens to those needs? Those needs don't go away because the facilities aren't there to, to support them. Well, in fact, so, Chief, you and your officers are the front line of mental health too often, absolutely. mental health service. What do you do about absolutely. that? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, I, you know, the, the late Benny Napoleon and I talked a, a few years back about mental illness uh, in, in, in incarceration. And, and, we, and he was telling me that, you know, over 70 percent at the time that we talked of, of the people that he had in the county jail had some form of mental illness nexus. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it's not necessarily being treated, which is why they are interacting with the police at a higher level. I'm happy to say here in Detroit, uh, we have implemented a, a, a CIT program. I'm hoping to grow that program, expand that program. But, but getting back to your, your question, I think there are so many different components to what makes for a successful police department. Uh, you can't do it without community. You absolutely should not do it without community. You can't do it without responsibility. And you can't do it without transparency. And I think that those are really the foundation or the, or the building blocks to a successful policing organization. When you talk about reduction of gun violence, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's the, the police are one part of that. The community is another part of that. You, you have to have responsible gun ownership, which includes securing weapons. You can't have weapons falling into the hands of, of criminals and, and criminal predators, uh, and, and you can't resolve conflict with weapons. So yeah. we're, we're going to have boots on the ground. We're going to focus 
we're going to identify these these hot spots and we're going to do so constitutionally and we're going to do so responsibly but at the same time we're going to hold people accountable who are victimizing our community well i want to let you weigh in on a piece of technology that many people feel is almost by definition uh inappropriate uh, in the way that it works especially against people of color and that's facial recognition technology uh, the detroit department was even a part of the 60 minutes uh investigation on this a couple of weeks ago so it's, there's a lot of attention on it how do you feel about this technology well i think the technology if used responsibly uh, can be a valuable tool for law enforcement. But again, it comes back to responsible use, use of the equipment. Uh, you have to have policy in place, you have to have accountability, and you have to have trained experts, which we do here in Detroit, to use it. And you also have to have some parameters in, for its use. You can't have random facial recognition uh, uh, observations taking place, which Detroit doesn't. Um, what Detroit has and what we have here is specific crimes that, that we will use the technology to attempt to identify a, a predator yeah. or a criminal. Uh, but we're not using this, this tool uh, indiscriminately. We're not using the tool irresponsibly. Uh, and, and we have people here that have been trained, uh, have received the highest level of training, and then there has to be a process in place to check their work. So there has to be peer review uh, in the process. Uh, and you ha again, you have to have policy that holds uh, the user accountable if, if there is an error. But I think that if used responsibly, the tool is a very valuable tool, uh, should not be used indiscriminately. Here in Detroit, it's used for specific high profile uh, uh, crimes, uh, violent crimes uh, and, and the like, but not uh, indiscriminately for misdemeanors uh, and lesser crimes. I, I probably don't need to ask you this. You're, you, you would like to continue to be the police chief. You'd like the job on a permanent basis, correct? Absolutely. I mean, okay. I, 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 I would love to be the, the police chief uh, for, for many years to come for the Detroit Police Department and for the citizens of this great city. But I'm not going to get distracted worrying about a process. Uh, sure. I've got crime to fight. Uh, it's, it's, it's 90 degrees for the next three days. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're all emerging from, from uh, this, this COVID yep. uh, situation, and we're starting to stretch out a little bit. We want people to safely enjoy our community. Uh, but but, but uh, I'm not going to focus on what's going to happen with the process that I can't control. I'll be there to interview, but uh, we'll let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to focus on this crime reduction. I'm going to target this gun violence. And uh, we're going to see if we can do something about this illegal drag racing in the community. That's a massive problem, too. People are out of patience on that. Chief, uh, so good to have you on Flashpoint for the first time. I hope uh, not the last time. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Yes, sir. Thank you, Devin. Have a good day. You got it. Chief Interim Chief James White will continue next on Flashpoint with our political roundtable. Go go away. Spin class was brutal. I bet. Hey, don't forget to check your blind spots. No worries. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? It's uh, Buick Envision. That's a really tight spot. I used to hate parallel parking. Me too. The all-new Buick Envision. Built around you. All of you. GM employees with a current eligible Buick lease get this low mileage lease on this 2021 Buick Envision for $249 per month. to support Local 4's coverage of the Tokyo Olympics, coming July 23rd. As some are heading back to the office, many are looking to make their work-from-home lifestyle 
permanent. I think this year has definitely pushed remote work even further into the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Monday morning at 6.30, Nick Monticelli reveals where to find fully remote jobs and how to stand out when you apply for these coveted positions. How do I snag one? Yeah, there's a few things that you can do. Watch Monday on Local 4 News Today. News, Everod's got it. Local 4 News Today. We are way behind on political talk on our program, and it's, of course, always been the lifeblood. So let's bring in this morning's political roundtable and kick the football around a little bit. Good to have with us Nolan Finley, editorial editor of the Detroit News. Steve uh, Mitchell is a pollster and analyst for Mitchell Research. Below him, Jill Alper of Alper Strategies and Stephen Henderson, the host of Detroit Today on WDET. I'm really curious, gang, about just your general take on how... Let's start with the, with, uh, with the national picture. We had a, a, a poll... We've seen a couple of polls come out this past week, Nolan. One of them showed us that 53% of Republicans believe that Donald Trump rightly won the last election. How in the world do we uh, move forward and get everybody on the same page uh, for just about anything, if that's where we're going to be? I think that'll take care of itself as the Republicans start refocusing more on 2022 and, and uh, prosecuting that election and forgetting about the last one. When their mission becomes beating Democrats, I don't think it'll be hard to bring them together and get them looking toward the future. It happened with Democrats in 2018, obviously. Coming out of 2016, I bet you'd have found an equal number of, of Democrats who thought that election shenanigans elected Donald Trump in 16. So I think Republicans will be focused on the future very quickly. I'll have to dig back through some polls. I don't remember seeing anything quite that dramatic, but Jill, let me give you a, a, maybe a, a, a statistic that maybe even is more eye-popping. About 23 percent of Republicans apparently believe that the left in America is led by a, a group of uh, satanic pedophiles. This uh, QAnon theory has taken hold uh, that uh, no amount of uh, truth serum seems to dispel. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that, Devin, and I'm not sure there will ever be voters who are open to voting for a Democrat. Um, but what we do <laughs> see in the country right now is Democrats leading at every level, the White House, the Senate, and the House. And here in Michigan, our top three constitutional offices, gerrymandering goes away after we have our new lines, and things are pretty evenly matched. Um, so despite the pandemic and everything that's gone down, um, we see uh, the governor doing um, better, um, six points better in a, in a recent poll. And in some level, those don't really matter. What does matter is the economic plan that's afoot, the resources there are that to, to spend, the, the plan that she had just announced this past week to put our economy back on track. Um, we're, we're just one point behind um, in unemployment, um, the national average, which means um, we're doing better than the rest of the country, which Michigan tends not to do better um, during times of turmoil um, in this country. Um, and every governor has been um, reelected for their second term back to 1962. So we'll have a, a top strong of the ticket. But you know, Joe, actually, uh, let me bring in Steve Mitchell. Uh, I, Steve and I saw each other this past week, and Steve had a really interesting uh, morsel of, uh, of history in what happens to governors in Michigan when the like party is in the White House. Steve, go ahead and expand on that. She's absolutely right when she says every governor has been reelected going back to 1962. The problem with that, however, is that every time for the last four governors that they've run for re-election, the opposite party's been in the White House. When uh, Jim Blanchard, John Engler, uh, Jennifer Granholm, and Rick Snyder ran, they were running with the opposite party in the White House, and the opposite party in the White House generally does very, very poorly in a midterm election. This time, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has to run with, uh, with a Democrat in the White House, Joe Biden, and Joe Biden will be unpopular by November of 2022. So I think that this is a, a, an historical fact that I think is more important than the fact that they're always reelected. And I think Governor Whitmer is a, is a great campaigner. Um, she has a lot of people who like what she did, a lot who didn't like what she did during the pandemic. But at the end of the day, she has to run with Joe Biden in the White House. The average loss yeah. uh, in Congress has been 26 seats when there's a when right. when uh, when the, they run in a midterm election. 
Really interesting, just kind of the pendulum theory and the way that things generally work. Uh, Stephen Henderson, let me bring you in. I kind of gritted my teeth a little bit at the way that everybody wanted to jump on James Craig as a candidate before we even got to the impact on the police department. We, we were happy to have the, uh, the new chief today on Flashpoint, so I guess now I'm ready to entertain thinking about what's uh, down the road. But give me your thumbnail on how you think that uh, James Craig would do as a Republican statewide candidate. I mean, I think he will do better uh, than a lot of people that they've been talking about. Uh, you know, he's he is a popular figure um, uh, because of his uh, his record in Detroit, uh, but also because of his pro gun his pro gun stance. Uh, you know, somebody that supports Donald Trump, who is uh, uh, popular in the in the Republican Party. I think if he has uh, a weakness, it's the fact that you know, I mean, he's never been elected to anything. Before he's he's a police officer, he's not a politician, um, and I think uh, he will have a hard time keeping up with uh, you know the, the kind of attacks that uh, that you would see Gretchen Whitmer and Democrats you know launch on on, on someone like that. Um, I, I don't know that he can kind of go toe to toe with the with the the, the clever kind of uh, uh, rhetorical. Um, uh, uh, advances that uh, Gretchen Whitmer has become really good at. Um, I, She's I, been missing I some of it on this Florida flight uh, controversy. Uh, yeah, they've been tripping over themselves on that. You know, I also am sort of intrigued by this this floating of Candace Miller as you know a potential lieutenant governor a candidate for him. You know, that that seems the flip to me. <laughs> if you put Candace Miller at the top of that ticket, I think you could really give. Uh, Whitmer a run for her money. Now, Candace Miller has said over and over she's not yep. interested in yep. the governor. I don't know why she'd be interested in lieutenant governor, but uh, a Miller Craig ticket, I think, uh, would would have some Democrats uh, pretty scared uh, about about next year. So I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you'd make of Craig Miller. Well, but before I get back to Nolan, um, Jill, I would uh, I would imagine a Candace Miller candidacy might concern you more than a James Craig one. Uh, sure, just because she's tested, yeah. uh, we we know more about her. She's vetted, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I agree with Stephen's assessment. Yeah. She, 100%. she just doesn't, seems very uh, run resistant. But Nolan, then, we have seen uh, people come out of law enforcement and they have some, they have, they have uh, administrative experience. They know how to run things. Uh, we've seen that with Warren Evans uh, running the county. But to not have legislative experience, that, that, that's, that's a problem, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, there's all, every candidate has some deficiencies. And I talked to Craig uh, last week for a column and he acknowledged he knows a whole lot about policing, but one of the reasons he hasn't jumped right in as a announced candidate is that he realizes he has a lot of work to do on other policy issues and he wants to be fully prepared. Now he's betting that law and order, public safety will be a major issue in 2022. I'm not so sure that's true in Michigan, uh, but uh, yeah, he understands he's got a lot of work to do, but he also has the advantage of at this point of having a real, really an impeccable character and uh, honest, transparent, uh, and he'll be running against a candidate who's deficient in those areas. So, as I said, they'll both have pros, they'll both have cons. Did somebody jump in there? Was I here? No, I think, Go ahead. I would think that the advantage you'd want if you were running James Craig, you know, Bill Schuette got about three percent, three and a half percent of the vote in Detroit last time. Maybe you raise that to four or five. Yeah. If you run I, I think. I think. I think. Steve. I think. I think uh, you know, Gretchen Whitmer won Macomb County. I, I, I think James Craig could could really take that away or take away the lead there. I, I'm, I'm just that. about to run out of time. I want Steve. You you told me this past. I think a lot of people, Steve Mitchell, believe that every election between now and uh, and and 24 is about Donald Trump. You don't think so. I don't think this election will be. The last three have been about Donald Trump. This one will not be because Donald Trump's not president anymore and he's not on the ticket. Now, he may be again in 2024. I don't think this is going to be an election about Trump. I think Craig has the ability to maybe get 8, 10, 12 percent out of the city of Detroit. He is very popular, and I tested him years ago uh, on some polling in the city. So uh, I think he's a strong candidate. We've seen law enforcement officers move from 
sheriff into uh, executive jobs in Wayne County, so he may be a good one uh, running for governor. Gang, I got to leave it there. I'm all out of time, but long before I ran out of questions. Take a quick break. Uh, we'll wrap things up for Flashpoint right after this. Whether your loved one is in surgery or the ICU, I'll be right there. When you need a lawyer who doesn't take a fee unless they win, I'll be right there. Lee was right there when my wife got rear-ended in Detroit. He got her $200,000. Call me. I'll be right there. For the best in sales, service, and selection, get to Golan Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, your Jeep dealer. During Jeep Freedom Days, take home the 2021 Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk 4x4, now only $238 a month employee, $279 friends and family. Or lease the 2021 Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited 4x4, starting at $310 a month employee, $358 friends and family. You search, you request, we deliver to your home or office. Shop GollingBloomfield.com. Golan Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Bloomfield Hills. I've never seen people pick up so many shifts. It didn't matter if they were tired. It didn't matter if they were scared because there was a patient that needed them and their team needed them. You knew what they were walking into. Good, the bad, the hope, and the heartbreak. The first vaccines we gave at Beaumont, that was a little bit of hope. But you can't stop and revel in it too long because you're not done. Hope helps get us through it. The vaccine can help us end it. Beat the pandemic with Beaumont. Whether you've been hit by a commercial truck or a compact car, I'll be right there. Whether you're in a hospital in Detroit or Troy, I'll be right there. Lee was right there when my daughter got hit by a semi on M59 and got her $700,000. Call me. I'll be right there. And just like that, we are all out of time. Thanks so much for being here. We will miss you next week. Enjoy the French Open. We will see you two weeks hence on Flashpoint.